We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Because that goal will serve to organize the best of our energies and skills. When President Kennedy spoke those words, little did I realize that for the next eight years, I will be deeply involved in that project. When he set the goal of landing men on the moon and returning them safely to Earth, he set in motion a sense of national pride. And for the people that worked on the project, it instilled a sense of pride and enthusiasm, just knowing they were part of this historical adventure. We were employed by Grumman Aircraft Engineering Corporation. Tom Kelly, engineer, 32 years old, responsible for the design of the lunar module. Me, 25 years old, high school graduate, responsible for coordinating engineering and manufacturing to build the ascent stage of the lunar module. Neither one of us knew the adventure that we were about to undertake. The construction of the lunar module tested the human spirit when facing impossible, seemingly impossible tasks to accomplish the building of the perfect machine. And although the landing on the moon is what is recorded in history, the real story is of the people that built it. Who were they? Where did they come from? What drove them to work difficult work, work schedules and accomplish the construction of the lunar module while at the same time, in the process, discovering the hidden talents and abilities that they possessed. They were young, 18 to 30 years old, for the most part. Blue-collar workers on the aircraft assembly line. And by today's standards, working for less than minimum wage. Little did we realize that the skills that they possessed would be just the beginning of their journey. They were going to build a spacecraft by hand, one rivet hole at a time. Well, OK, why rivet holes? The holes for the rivets needed to be drilled to plus or minus two thousandths of an inch, about the thickness of a Coke can. Without the proper rivet hole, the rivet is useless. And although this was similar to aircraft construction, the main difference was that they never knew the pilot that was going to fly the airplane that they built. But they were going to know the astronauts, their names, their families, their careers. This was the first step in making this a very personal endeavor. The slogan became, there are no repair stations on the way to the moon. This needs to be perfect. Well, OK, how do you convince people that they have a responsibility and that the lives of the astronauts are virtually in their hands, that they're not just there for a paycheck. If I can think of one word to use as a catalyst to accomplish this, it would be family. Family is defined as one or more parents and their children living together as a unit. OK, how does this get us to the moon? The definition of family over the years has changed, and it's expanded to mean other things. For instance, in Grumman, we considered ourselves part of the Grumman family because of the togetherness that existed in the company since its inception. We were a team of people building great airplanes. For instance, producing 600 warplanes per month during World War II. A well-functioning family will allow its members to grow and accomplish great things as a result of their support. But sadly, in today's workplace, this support structure, workplace and our culture, this support structure has all but vanished. As human beings, we, tend, we, we sometimes fail to realize that we need each other to succeed. So in the context of this talk, I would use the word family to mean a national family composed of the engineers, the, the, uh, the, the workers, the American public, the workers' families, all working together, supporting each other, personally and technically, and sharing their knowledge and their pride and their skill to make this national goal a success. 
the world was watching. Where do we start? Personnel were selected from the aircraft departments, and they were assigned to the lunar module department. There was a job for everyone, but the job had to be the right job. Placing a person in a position that overwhelms their ability does nothing for that person or for the project. They needed to be confident of their skills. There were no instruction manuals. Each had to figure out how they were going to accomplish the task at hand. And this is where teamwork came in, where they all helped each other. Cleanliness and safety were, an, were just as important as building the vehicle. And those that did not possess the mechanical ability or were handicapped were placed in charge of cleanliness and safety. Now notice I said placed in charge of. This was not just sweep the floor. They understood that they were just as important as that mechanic that could drill a close tolerance rivet hole. They would be responsible to be sure the work area was clean and clutter free. And when the vehicle was ready to be shipped to the clean rooms for systems installation, that it was free of dust and debris, and on occasion that wayward tool that might have been left behind. Slowly construction started. First small assemblies, then larger assemblies, and finally the vehicle. Through quality control and inspection, they learned their weaknesses. Errors were made, but each became a learning experience. Corrective action was a team effort. The, the rule was, if you make a mistake, admit it, and we will figure out how to fix it. But if you make a, the hard, fast rule was, if you make a mistake and cover it up, you are off the program. It wasn't long before each was helping the other. Challenges and development of procedures became a team effort. The family, the work family was starting to function as a team. The personal visits from the astronauts brought the personal message home. Over time, schedules became more intense. Long work hours were the norm. Workers were spending less time at home with their families. Without the family support, not only the workers' performance, but family relationships could suffer. The families needed to understand that they were an important part of the effort. So Club Apollo was formed, so workers could socialize with their friends. They raised money for picnics and outings and bus trips, so they could spend quality time with their family. Through Club Apollo, the, the families understood their, the responsibilities that their spouses had, and that their support was a critical part of the success of the project. Through the years, I watched our Luna Mondrial family accomplish unbelievable tasks. And I can honestly say that I have never been prouder of the people that I worked with. And we maintain those relationships to this day. So with your permission, I would like to take you on a short journey of how the lunar module was constructed and explain some of these stories. Early on in the program, we realized that square pegs do not fit in round holes. The front face of the vehicle was originally designed with a round hatch until we realized that the backpack that the astronauts wore was square. So the hatch was changed to square. The midsection housed the ascent engine and the docking tunnel. This, the thin material used in this component was the first challenge for the mechanics on how, on how to handle this thin material where dropping a pencil could penetrate the material. Through their skill and knowledge, they were able to establish different procedures to, to build this component with virtually little to no damage to the material. This component also almost cost me my job. We were removing it from the fixture, and some safety bars were not engaged. The whole thing collapsed like a pancake. Of course, I had to report to corporate headquarters, and I was sure 
my career was over. Instead, they told me to go back, take corrective action so it doesn't happen again, and get us back on schedule. That was the kind of place Grumman was. The cabin crew was responsible for joining the front face, the cabin skins, and the midsection into one pressure-tight vessel, riveted and sealed, with minimum to zero leakage within the engineering tolerances. On the Apollo 11 launch, this is the crew watching the launch from the shop. That's me. Uh, you can imagine what was going through their mind. The years of work and dedication was on display for all the world to see. This was a very solemn moment. This was a different time, a different generation. The programs and procedures and projects that created this exceptional group of people has all has vanished, has, has been lost. The pride and dedication that existed then is rare in today's workplace. So what does this mean for the future? If we are to accomplish technical greatness and expose the invisible future that is out there, we must begin with education and instill not only personal pride, but national pride in our younger workforce. We have built machines that will do almost everything for us. But for mankind to truly accomplish great things, the glow of the invisible human spirit must be reignited. It's been my pleasure to present this glimpse of the past in the hope that it will spark a resurgence in promoting and developing individual creativity and pride in the workplace. Thank you.